Well, welcome to our services for Carmichael Baptist Church. It's good to be with you once again this Sunday. We're going to be talking about the preeminence of love. Start a little study in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which hopefully will be a blessing to you if you stick with us over the next uh, couple months, Lord willing. Now, when I was running cross-country in junior high, I had what was probably my most glorious and my most humiliating race. Started out pretty normally. I was running my usual pace, kind of getting into my zone. But after a while, I began to notice there's not any runners around me. And I kind of glanced back and I saw the, the high schoolers way back there, like a quarter mile behind me. And suddenly I, I found this energy I never knew I had. And I began to, to push it harder than ever for the rest of the course. And I crossed that finish line. And with joy, I, I threw up my arms. First place. But as I said, this was also my most uh, humiliating race. After the excitement died down, it was found out that I had actually skipped a turn. It wasn't on purpose. I just missed a turn and kind of cut off a good part of the course that everybody else ran. So rightfully, I was disqualified. All of that effort was in vain. Not one of my favorite memories. I tell you that story because I think there's a lot of people that are going to face a similar but far greater shame in eternity. They ran their race hard. They give a lot of money to the church. They serve with great energy. They, they're praised and honored of men. And they go to meet the Lord and they're going with boasting and self-confidence, ready to throw up their arms in victory, receive their prize. But sadly, they missed the most important part of everything that we are to be doing. The heart of it all, they've missed love. That's the message that Paul gives the Corinthian church in this chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. This was a very talented group of people. They had all these supernatural spiritual gifts. Problem was that they magnified these abilities above everything else. And so those that had those gifts were filled with pride. Those that didn't have the gifts were filled with jealousy. And church is basically, it seems for the Corinthians, become kind of a competition for the spotlight. Chapter 12, Paul rebukes that spirit. He reminds him, you are a church body. Those gifts are not to ex uh, exalt an individual in and of themselves, but they're to be used as a part of the whole. Chapter 14, he gets into practical teaching on how to use those particular gifts. But in between those two chapters, he emphasizes the key to it all. What really sets God's people apart, what makes them a powerful tool in His hand, is not the outer ability or skill or worldly opportunity. It's what's in the heart. It's our love. And so we're going to examine this beautiful chapter, as I said, over the next couple weeks, maybe months. But what I pray that you see as we go through this is the preeminence of love. No matter what area of ministry you are focused on, you got to have love. And if you have that, oh, what wonderful things God will accomplish through you. So let's break it down. I, before I even get into the text, actually, I kind of want to just talk about what love is. And I know that's really basic, but it's one of the most corrupted words in our English language. So we got to get those incorrect ideas out of our mind. And so we're, we're focused on where we need to be as we go forward in this chapter. First of all, love is not lust. That's basically all the world thinks about anymore. Two people eye each other up and down. They see somebody that's attractive. They want to win that person over to being attracted to them. But it's all about that sexual desire that we have. The Greek word for that is actually eros, and it never appears in the New Testament. It might be natural and wonderful to be attracted to your spouse, but that's not what loving them is all about. It's 
So get that out of your mind. Secondly, love is not emotion. That's another way that the world tends to define love. This special, tingly feeling that you get when you're around someone and you're on cloud nine because they're so wonderful. Again, that's not wrong in and of itself, but feelings come and go. And what we're talking about in this love of 1 Corinthians 13 is something far more lasting. Here's a surprising statement, perhaps to many of you. This is not charity. Now, I know some of you, you heard me say that, and you look down at your King James Version Bible, if that's what you got, and you see the word charity. That's what the whole chapter is about. So what am I saying? Well, Paul didn't use the English word charity. He wrote in the Greek, and he used the word agape. That is most often in the New Testament translated love, and it really ought to be here. This does involve kind actions towards others, but it's more than that. Charity in our minds, at least in our Western culture, it's all about just me giving to somebody else because of their need. And that's nice in and of of itself, but here's the thing. People can give for the wrong reasons. They might give to exalt themselves. They might give because they feel it's their duty or they feel guilty, but they're devoid of true love, of agape. So that's why I say it's not just charity. What's our definition? Well, here's what I want you to think about. Love is a Christ-like spirit of self-sacrifice. What are we talking about? What's our standard? Jesus says in John 13, verse 34, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. The love of Christ is our standard. Let's just think about it for a minute. You know, Jesus says in John 13, or it's, it's said of Jesus in John 13, verse 1, When he knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father, he's going to the cross. Having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Jesus did not love his disciples until they got in the upper room. He didn't love them until they got to the Garden of Gethsemane. He didn't even stop loving them when he got nailed to the cross and only John was there and in disbelief. He loved them to his very last breath. This is love that is not just a fleeting feeling that comes and goes. It's a lasting devotion. John 15, 13, our Lord says this to His disciples in that upper room. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Christ-like love has no price that it wouldn't pay. Jesus was willing to give up absolutely everything, every ounce of his energy, every ounce of his being, every ounce of his life, and more than that, to endure the lowest hell for those that he loved. But then Romans 5, 6 through 8, puts this in the most amazing perspective. It says, For when we were yet without strength, In due time, Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is unconditional love. It's not something that's generated from those disciples, from some other individual. It comes from Christ and his heart, and it flows from him to others. Jesus loved us when we had nothing to offer Him. In fact, in our depravity, we're no different than those who nailed Him to the cross, and yet He loved us. That's the standard we're talking about. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about. Not some mushy, emotional love, not some lust of the world. No, the love of Christ. But that's Christ's love. Somebody might hear this and say, yeah, I can see this description and I can picture Jesus feeling this way, but how can I experience that? You know, if we were on a basketball team and I was your coach and I showed you some some videos of LeBron dunking the basketball all over everybody and I said, I want you to go out there today and I want you to play like LeBron. 
Well, you might feel a little overwhelmed by that. We're not built like LeBron. We don't have his natural ability. And in that same mind frame, you might say, well, this is Christ. How can I, a pathetic fallen sinner, go out and love like Jesus? How is that even possible? Ah, but let me show you something. Galatians 5, verse 22 tells us the fruit of the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, that Christ hath bestowed upon us, that dwells in us as His people. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Jesus doesn't just command us to love. Jesus died on the cross to deliver us from our sins and to bring us into His love and to depart His love into us through the Spirit. He's the one that stirs up and strengthens our love. And I want you to get this. Love is not like a gift of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit, certain people may have a gift and an ability and a natural talent and an opportunity that other people don't. And that's fine. We all have differing gifts. All of us have the fruits of the Spirit. Every single person from the youngest believer to the oldest believer, from the pastor to the lay person, we all have the ability, the opportunity, the power through the Spirit to show Christ like love. The more led of the Spirit we are, the more like Jesus we become, the more we show His agape. Now that's all introduction. That's an 11-minute, 12-minute introduction for you. I need to get into the text, though, because we want to get through at least the first couple of verses of this amazing chapter and uh, kind of whet our appetite for the, some of the study to come. So as we think about this Christ-like love, let's think about what Paul says about it to the Corinthian church and to us. The preeminence of love. First of all, if you've got Christ-like love, it's going to empower your spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 13, 1, Paul says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Once again, I remind you, Paul's talking to this church that's full of these gifted individuals and everyone's looking to showcase their abilities. And it seems what they coveted most was the gift of tongues. To be able to speak in this unknown language, it's just impressive and it puts you in the spotlight and you're communicating a message that's supernatural from God. But the apostle tells them, if you don't have Christ-like love, even if you spoke the language of angels, it's like sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. There's a quote I'll give you from William Barclay. It helps us to understand that statement of Paul's. In the worship of Sibylle and Dionysus, two pagan false gods, there was speaking in ecstatic languages, accompanied by clanging cymbals, smashing gongs, and blaring trumpets. So essentially what Paul's saying here in this text is that if you don't have love as your motive, and maybe you, you have this ecstatic, this supernatural gift of speaking in the tongues, well, it's no different than what the idolaters are doing. It's really just meaningless noise. That's all it is. You ever listen to a, an orchestra while they're warming up? Everybody's got their little piece of music to themselves, and they're trying to get their, their instrument in tune, and it's all dissonant, and everybody's kind of playing, and it's, it's chaotic, not real pleasant to listen to. Then the conductor walks in, he taps his baton, Everybody's got their music in front and they begin to play in harmony. And here is this beautiful music that flows from them all together. And that's what love does. It's like that conductor. And that's what the Spirit does as He stirs up our love. Moves us to see the true gift that God has given us, but not just that we've got a gift. How we're to use that gift in connection with everyone else. So I'm not looking to gain the spotlight and show off. I'm looking to serve the Lord. I'm looking to serve others. And when I've got that loving mentality, that's when I find the real power of my spiritual gift. That's when it begins to truly be used as God intends. And maybe that's behind the scenes for you. Maybe that's insignificant in the eyes of others, but God's using you and He's doing something wonderful and you become part of that 
that greater work that he's doing through the church. You've got to have love if you're going to find the true power of your spiritual gift. Secondly, love empowers our knowledge. Verse 2, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and have not charity, I am nothing. Now Paul was a pretty knowledgeable man. He actually used to be a leader among the Pharisees. He sat at the feet of the learned Gamaliel. But you know, Paul was kind of like a man who he memorized every road and every town on a map but it did him no good because he didn't know what his destination was. That's kind of what the Bible was like to the Pharisee, to someone like Paul, and sadly to a lot of individuals today. They may have it a lot in their heads, but they don't know the real message of the Word. They don't see the true road map of God's purpose in our life that's there. Knowledge without love is useless. It's even hurtful because it leads to pride and it leads to legalism and it perverts the truth and creates idols. Ah, but if you've got love, if you can sing with David, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Then you can also sing as he does in Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. When you're fueled by love, I tell you, that opens up the word of God to you. That opens up your understanding because you're fellowshipping with the Lord in it. You're not just seeing some history. You're not just seeing some law, some commands, some verses to memorize. The Lord speaks to you in His Word. And it begins to bless your heart and to fill up your heart and encourage you in His promises and to guide you in His way. You want to understand the Word of God, you need to seek that love. You need to read it in love. And I can tell you, that will empower your knowledge. But then thirdly, love empowers our faith. The other end of verse 2 says, And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. A verse that goes along with that, Mark 11, 23. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. That's quite a wonderful promise of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can command a mountain and it's cast out of your way. What a dramatic, powerful example of faith. But Paul gives us this perspective. He says, if a man has that absolute confidence in God, but if he doesn't have love, what good is that going to do? So you can rip up a mountain and throw it in the ocean. What what is that really going to accomplish? The point of mountains being removed, is so they're out of the way of where I need to be following the Lord. And I, I like to think of this in terms of, well, the mountain of a sin in my life, a struggle in my life. Uh, a worldly obstacle that's holding me back or standing in the way of my ministry. And those mountains are removed by faith. This isn't about me, though. Faith never seeks our own selfish glory. Faith never seeks our own worldly desire. Faith is focused on the Lord. Forsaking all, I trust Him. That's faith. In fact, Galatians chapter 5 tells us that faith worketh by love. James puts it a different way. James 2.20, he says, But wilt thou know, not know, O vain man, that faith without works, that is, loving works, is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Abraham's faith was, ma- was manifest because he loved God. He's willing to leave everything for the Lord. And then he loved him so much when God said, I want you to take your own son and I want you to offer him up on Mount Moriah. Love moved him up that mountain. He didn't cast the mountain out of the way. He climbed the mountain. And he was ready to slay his only son before God stayed his hand. Love empowers faith. If you're going to truly have faith, your faith going to grow Well, you need to have that love. You need to seek it. Fourthly, love empowers our kindness. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3 says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. 
You ever wish, you know, if I just, if I could just have a million dollars, boy, I could do something great for the Lord. Boy, I would give to the needs of others and I would help all these missions. If I just had that, you know, chances are you'd never have enough if that's your mentality because you get your million and, and then you would say, well, I need two million. The Christian, though, is truly already rich. We're rich in the love of Christ. You may not have all the resources in the world to be able to help all the missionaries or solve all the problems that are out there, but you do have what God would have you to have to serve where He would put you. And love is what you need to be faithful in that, to be able to be a blessing to those that God brings into your life. And you have that opportunity, and you have those resources. God's put you here for that. Love helps us to overcome the barrier of selfishness and to find the strength to do what we can to supply the need of others regardless of the cost. No ulterior motive, no holding back, not when kindness flows from the heart, from love. Finally, love empowers our sacrifice. Paul says at the end of verse 3, And though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. What a statement. Can someone give up their body to be burned? Burned at the stake. And yet it's still unprofitable in God's sight. What a horrible waste. And yet, you know, that's true. If the heart is not right, there have been people that have died essentially in vain. Let me put it to you this way. Let's say I went up to Jeff Bezos. Richest man. Maybe he's the second richest man in the world. I don't keep up. But let's say I went up to him, this billionaire, and, and I gave him 10 bucks. Do you think Jeff Bezos would be impressed? You know, he's got billions and billions. That's like a penny to him. He'd probably call his security on me. In fact, what if I, what if I took $10 out of Jeff Bezos' wallet and then I handed it back to him? Really not impressed then. He's really calling security, right? I say that just to get you to think, though. God owns all things. Whatever you have, whatever ability you have, you're a steward of that. You don't own it. It's not something extra that belongs to you and you're giving to God. It's all His. And God can accomplish anything He purposes. So if you have this idea in your mind, I'm giving something to God or doing something for God in order to impress Him, well, you're missing the point. What God desires of His people is love. That willingness to take what He bestows upon us, our money, our talents, our ability, our time, our very life, and to be able to lay it down in love, sacrificing it for His glory, desiring that His name would be uplifted. That's what honors Him. He doesn't need what you have. He desires your love and your willingness to use what He's given you for His glory. Love empowers you to make that sacrifice. You're going to find strength to give beyond what you thought you could and to find a joy even while you do it. That's the power of love. Just in closing, I want you to examine your love. Think about what you give. Think about what you do for others. Think about what you do for the Lord. But I, I want you to go beyond that. Why do you do it? Is it from the heart? When God looks beyond just the outer and He sees the very depths of your being and He sees your true motive, does He see your love? Oh, I pray that it's so. And I want you to appreciate the value of that. Money fades away, abilities weaken, the praise of men is silent, but love and, and, and what love accomplishes, God accomplishes through our love, that has an eternal reward. That brings an eternal joy. So I want us to make this our prayer and I want us to make this the motivation for study and I want us to make this the goal in every single thing that we do that we would be more loving. Yes, I need the spiritual gifts and I want to recognize those gifts and I want strength to use those gifts and I want resources in this world that I can use. But what I need, Lord, is love. Oh, fill me with the love of Christ. And if I've got that, boy, I've got what I need. 
Understand your potential for love. You know, you might not have, again, the greatest talents or opportunities for worldly success, but if you've got the Spirit dwelling in you, there's no, no limit to that most wonderful fruit in you. What a wonderful study we have before us. Give attention to 1 Corinthians 13. Give attention to the wonder of love and the hope we have in it through the Holy Spirit. Lord, fill us with your love. Pray that's a blessing to you today. Look forward again to getting deeper into this study in the weeks to come. May the Lord bless you.